I want to welcome Mark Charles to Let's Talk Native. Uh, Mark Charles is a candidate for the U.S. presidency for 2020. Um, he's an author, a uh, public speaker, and uh, I want to find out more about what uh, what is involved with this with this candidacy. What's the uh, what is what Mark is trying to accomplish here, and um, and talk to him a little bit about some of what his messaging has been. So, Mark, I want to welcome you to Let's Talk Native. Well, yeah. Hey, John. Thank you very much. It's good to be here, and uh, I would very much like to just introduce myself traditionally, so that uh, my relatives listening on the air can know who I am. But yeah, uh, hey, Mark Charles Yunus. Yeah, sin beke dene initially do tohiglini bashes chin, sin beke dene dasha che do tohle chi ni dasha nella. Thank you, John, for allowing me to introduce myself. Um, in the Navajo culture, when we introduce ourselves, we always give our four clans. And we're a matrilineal people, and our identities come from our mother's mother. Now, my mother's mother is American of Dutch heritage, and so I say Tsin Bekei Dene. Translated, that means I'm from the Wooden Shoe people. My second clan, my father's mother, is Tohiglini, which is the waters that flow together. My third clan, my mother's father, is also Tsin Bekei Dene. And then my fourth clan, my father's father, is Totochitni. That's the Bitterwater clan. It's one of the original clans for Navajo people. Okay, um, so where do you where do you uh, live first? So we'll, we'll start right there. I moved to Washington D.C. with my family. Uh, we moved here about four years ago, and uh, we moved here from uh, the Navajo Reservation. We were living uh, in Fort Defiance, right near the capital of our nation, which is Wonder Rock. Okay, and, and you do identify yourself as Navajo? Yes. Well, I identify myself as both. The daughter, the son, the son of my mother, and the son of my father. So my mother is American of Dutch heritage, and so I identify myself as that, as well as identify myself as the son of my father, who is Navajo. So again, because our people are matrilineal, if I did not acknowledge my mother, I would not be acknowledging my identity as a Navajo person. Um, so I tell people the way I just introduce myself that. I am the son of both of my parents sure. and all four of my grandparents. Sure. All right. So um, you are um, you, you've announced uh, it's a couple of weeks in now. I, I assume uh, that you that you plan to run for the presidency of the United States. Um, now, are you running as a again as as a native person? Are you, obviously, you're you're running as an American because only an American be, can be a, uh, a president of the United States. So. Um, would you characterize yourself as running as a uh, um, as an as a native person running for the presidency? Yes, I would. In my uh, press release that I sent out last week and is available on my website, I identify that I am a dual citizen of both the United States and the Navajo Nation. Okay. And so I am very much running not only as an American citizen, but as a citizen of the Navajo Nation and as someone who carries the concerns and the burdens and the the well-being of that community within within my campaign okay and and we'll we'll talk about that we'll talk about your um why exactly you're running uh but i, I do want to i i saw your 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 tedx talk uh from january and uh and i know quite a bit about the doctrine of discovery i've, I've spoken uh spoken of it and uh, I've had uh, several guests, including folks like Stephen Newcomb and others, on my on my program a number of times. Um, and as I listen to you talk about the doctrine of discovery, and I agree with with much of your characterization of the doctrine of discovery, um, but it, it's the uh, I, I guess it's the conclusion that that I'm a little that I'm a little confused about because. I mean, the doctrine of discovery, as as you well state, is is a is a racist, a white supremacist um, doctrine uh, born out of uh, out of the church that that all of the denominations of Christianity have embraced in, at some level. Um, although many of them have repudiated it uh, in modern times, but but certainly whether it was the Anglican Church of uh, of Great Britain or whether it was the uh, the, the the Catholic churches of, uh, of Portugal and um, Spain and uh, and others, they Embrace this notion that, under the doctrine of discovery, um, a a Christian nation of Europe could claim the the land, the freedom, the lives, the possessions of of uh, of, a, of a pagan people. And as you well stated in your TED talk, um, that they could regard uh, non Christians as less than human, and 
uh, and so be able to promote things like slavery and uh, and genocide and and the, and the whole bit. I guess where when you get to the place uh, in your TED talk where you start talking about Native people not being a part of We the People, um, I get that too, and and including you know Article One, Section Two of the, Con- the Constitution, where um, where our people are not included in part of the Constitution. But I don't I don't view it as that as that being some sort of travesty. I mean, uh, for me, when the, I look at the U.S. Constitution, where we are mentioned three times. One that we, the President of the United States, can negotiate treaties with us, just like they could. The President could do that with foreign governments. Where Congress shall have the power to regulate commerce in and among several states with foreign nations and with Native people. It's still not disrespectful, and the fact that that we are not included as a, as a taxable people uh, people for apportionment of taxes or representation of Congress. I don't think that our people were were asking for that to be a part of that that we the people. So when you when you call out the doctrine of discovery on the we the people issue, I'm not sure I mean, maybe you can you can offer some clarity on on why you think we need to address the doctrine of discovery to address the fact that 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 native people fr- frankly may not even want to be a part of the United States but but certainly are not. Well, thank you for giving me a chance to respond to that. And I want to even say how much I appreciate the work of Steve Newcomb. You know, his book, uh, Pagans in the Promised Land, um, was one of the early books I was, or his work was, I was exposed to, um, probably almost a decade ago. And, you know, I, he has been doing a tremendous job of trying to bring the issue of the doctrine of discovery really to the forefront of the national dialogue. And, um, I appreciate the work he's done. I think uh, his book, everyone should read it, and I recommend it most every place I go. So, um, yeah, I, I, and I want to acknowledge that there is a large disagreement, a large um, divide within our Native communities, within Indian country. You know, there are some who believe we don't want to be a part of this nation, and we, we just want to have our traditional sovereignty back, and there are others who but, but very how does, much accept. Uh, but how does that and work? Embrace Mark. Mark, if, if you don't, but how do how can you reconcile those two things? How can we claim sovereignty and distinction, and yet be a part of uh, you know of of the we the people? I, that's what I'm I'm wrestling well, that, with. Well, that's the challenge. Well, what I'm saying is there's there's people coming to this the table from both sides of that argument. Um, you know, I, I'm Navajo and. Our, our Navajo and people and other tribes fought as co-talkers throughout both World War I and World War II. Many of our co-talkers literally came from the boarding schools where their languages and their culture were being beaten out of them, and they went into the U.S. Marine Corps, and they used the language that they were able to retain under extreme duress and use that to help this nation win a very major war. Yeah, but but wouldn't you consider you know? residential schools as as almost conditioning our people for the for the U.S. military in the first place? Well, that, I mean, this is yes. This that was the goal of the of the boarding schools was to was to put them into these military style boarding schools to remove our language and remove our culture. It was a forced assimilation program that our nation was that the nation was enacting on native peoples to assimilate us. And yet many of our people went on to say, okay, well, we're, we still want to fight on behalf of this land, on behalf of Turtle Island. Yeah. But, but and many but, of those people but, were not recognized. Their, their, their sacrifice was not recognized for many years. And many of our, of our code talkers had to live almost in, in the shadows for a long time because the country wasn't willing yet to acknowledge the work that they had done. It wasn't until just a few decades ago that they began to acknowledge publicly the sacrifice and the work of the code talkers. But, but even, even the, um, the enlistment into the, in the U.S. military is still a part of, uh, almost a part of that, that assimilation process that, uh, that, you know, uh, but that came out of the residential schools and, of course, you know, policies before that. So, I mean, it... To, to suggest that enlisting is it was an act that um, uh, that wasn't consistent with with 
of the assimilation is is not exactly accurate either, right? Well, what I'm trying to acknowledge is that there are people within our community who have, I don't know if I want to say the word embraced, but acknowledge that, yeah, we are now citizens, or at least partial citizens of this nation, and have fought and sacrificed and invested in um, whether it's serving in the military, whether it's voting, whether it's uh, getting an education, all that we have participated as as citizens within this country. Well, it's, um, and so so in other words, I mean, the the assimilation policy was successful. Um, you might want to say that. It, well, I mean, because you you actually, I, I remember in the beginning of um, uh, of your TED talk, you actually referred to. The Pamunkey and and the Piscataway and the and the Haudenosaunee as having been ethnically cleansed, and you know we could argue that under this this policy of assimilation, ethnic cleansing was was the broad based U.S. policy that would you know not only create the residential schools but you know uh, a, a disproportionate amount of enlisting in the military, um, and frankly yeah. even you know, even running for office, whether it's Congress like uh, Deborah Holland or uh, Sharice David, or, or you mm-hmm. running for president. Yes. And I would say the the boarding school that actually that policy was enacted because the the nation was by and large losing its stomach for the outright genocide. Um, you know, this is what the Indian problem that um, Pratt was addressing when he laid out his argument for the boarding schools. You know, this is just, just in 19, 1892, just a couple of years after Wounded Knee, and the nation had been fighting, led by presidents like Abraham Lincoln, a very genocidal period of warfare against Native people. So so implicit, or so direct was this, this battle that even uh, Peter Burnett, who was the um, governor of California in his first State of the State address in 1851, um, he said that a war of extermination will continue to be waged between the races until the Indian race becomes extinct must be expected. While we cannot anticipate this result, but with painful regret, the inevitable destiny of the race is beyond the power or wisdom of man to avert. You know, and then two years after signing the Pacific Railway Act, Abraham Lincoln literally ethnically cleanses the Dakota and the Winnebago from Minnesota, the Cheyenne and Arapaho from Colorado and Wyoming, and the New Mexico and Mescalero Apache from the territory of New Mexico, which are three of the primary routes for the Transcontinental Railway. And but, so but, but, the, resident, but residential schools, um, by the definition of genocide, are really a conti- would are really a continuation of genocide. We could argue that it was perhaps more compassionate because it's not it wasn't mass slaughter. But but by any well, that, definition of genocide, residential schools still qualify. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's what that's what General or uh, that's what uh, Pratt lays out, which is let's stop killing them and let's now kill the Indian to save the man. And then he builds a very white supremacist argument, borrowing from the experience of slavery, when he says, you know, as horrible as slavery was, it bestowed upon the African the most, the greatest blessing they've ever received, which is it brought them from cannibalism and savagery in Africa to partial citizenship and English speaking in America. And so, this, this, yeah, I completely agree. This residential boarding school system was absolutely rooted in this abhorrent lie of white supremacy that now um, it, it's, it's lost, this nation had lost most of its stomach for outright slaughter of people, and now it was working on a cultural genocide of let's kill the Indian to save the man. Right. Well, Which I mean, was, again, more socially palatable than the outright slaughter. Although that I mean, was the that was the Indian problem that they were trying to address in ninety two, which is we still want the land. The Indians are still there. So rather and but it's not as as good to just slaughter them anymore, so let's try to find another way. 
Well, and and again, elimin- elimination by another policy, and and in fact, you, we could go right to the the um, uh, Indian Citizenship Act, which at the time, if you looked at it from an international law standpoint, this idea of denationalizing of people was already being talked of as as a war crime in 1913. So in 1924, when they passed the Indian Citizenship Act, it is it is still essentially, for all intents and purposes, a war crime, and that's go- all going on in the midst of residential school training and uh, uh and, and really absolutely and, and all of that so all right let me, and let then me on top of that you don't even get the right to vote for the navajo and other tribes in arizona and new mexico until 1948 well even I mean, though we it, became it, citizens in we, 24 well we, we were not did we given know? the full rights of citizenship um and though well, this is the whole point of my campaign which is the nation has never decided it wants to be a place where we the people means all the people. Well, and nor, That's nor the have point we, of my campaign. But nor have nor have native yeah. people decided that. And so when well, when, I look, and, when I look at something is, like when I look at something like the Indian Citizenship Act, that's a declaration declaring we're citizens. It's not a granting of citizenship. Yes. And so when when I hear people say, "Well, we became citizens in 1924," I ask that question: Did we? I mean, uh, uh, the Haudenosaunee actually took a position um, when the first draft notices showed up for World War II. Well, you can't draft us, and that's why you know. Uh, again, they went through a little, a little bit of a a, uh, a PR campaign to declare you know, war um, uh, individually. But I mean, th- this whole notion mm-hmm. that um, so when you ask that question, when did the United States decide that we, the people, should include Native people? That's there is no date. Even the, even the the Indian Citizenship Act of nineteen twenty four. I mean, you go back farther yet. You go to the Fourteenth Amendment. We obviously weren't covered by the Fourteenth Amendment. That's why they tried to, the, 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 the Citizenship Act. And the Citizenship Act didn't do it either because in 1934 they tried the, the Indian Reorganization Act. So once again, they acknowledged that, that we had not all became U.S. citizens. And, and even today, they'll look back today and they'll say, well, if you're trying to get land placed into trust, you, you can't have land placed into trust unless you can prove in 1934 you were under the jurisdiction of, uh, of the United States. Well, if – if we were if we were made U.S. citizens in twenty four, and then in nineteen thirty four they 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 passed this Indian Reorganization Act, how is it that there there still could have been Native people who are not under the jurisdiction unless they recognize that our distinction still very much did exist? And I would say that is the exact conversation I am trying to raise. The heart of my campaign is I am saying we need a national dialogue on race, gender, and class, a conversation I would put on par with the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions that happened in South Africa, in Rwanda, and in Canada. I would call ours Truth and Conciliation, because again, reconciliation is a misnomer. It implies there was a previous harmony, which clearly didn't exist here. Steve Newcomb points that out very clearly in his book. And so, and so the question I'm saying is, and you can answer it from both sides, yes, the nation has never decided it really wants to include people of color, natives, Africans, and others, in their understanding of who's a citizen of this place. And you can also argue it from our community standpoint and say, yeah, we never fully agreed that we wanted to be citizens. We, and so we've never had this debate. We've never had the actual conversation on a national level with input from all sides that says, is this what we want to be? Well, let me ask and you this. I would let me, let me... love it. I would love it if our people would come to the table and if they feel strongly to say, I don't want to be a citizen of this nation, but I, I'm not leaving because this is where my community is and this is where my land is and this is where our home has been since before Columbus got lost at sea, then absolutely we have to figure that out. Well, do you so? Then tell me this. So, do you support both the the um, again full assimilation of native people and the full distinction of native people at the same time? I mean, are, would you I am su- saying, would you would you recognize? I'm saying, would you recognize I'm the sovereignty? We have to decide what we want to be. Well, I mean, we've yeah, but, never decided this. Well, who's we? We've had these the the, na- the nation and wait native wait wait. I'm sorry. And, when you say when you what you mean the United States or native people? I'm saying both. 
Because they, there are many native territories that have that assert over and over again that they are distinct from the United States and that their lands are not part mm-hmm. of, of the United States. And in fact, the argument that you can make out of doctrine of, of the doctrine of discovery, and of course the racist land title uh, um, law that comes comes from Johnson v. McIntosh and, and other places, is that we have a rightful claim for our lands b- to be distinct. In fact, there is very little evidence to suggest that the United States ever lawfully. Um, even even with the doctrine of discovery and Johnson v. McIntosh and all that stuff, there are many territories like like Haudenosaunee lands where the where treaties say the United States recognized that our land is ours and they were never never claimed the same. Yet we still end up in this place where there where there are many people who say, well, yeah, we were made citizens in 1924, and never said, well, the United States declared we were citizens, but not necessarily all, we didn't all necessarily embrace it. So I guess it. it, it if you're running a, a, if you're the president of the United States, will you recognize the the distinction and and the sovereignty, not just tribal sovereignty, but but real sovereignty for for uh, for Native people who choose to be separate and distinct from the United States? That is the conversation I want the everyone on in Turtle Island to have through this Truth and Conciliation Commission. What I'm saying is we've never. Like, yes, we have, we've had different sides, and the, the U.S. has enacted policy here, and in some places Native communities have pushed back, in other places they've submitted to it, but there hasn't necessarily been a, a formal decision of this, this nation wants to actually become citizens and this nation wants to be outside of that citizenship. This is what I'm saying. This is the conversation we have to have, and it's a messy, it's a long, it's going to be a, a, a difficult conversation to have, but we've never had it. Well, and in fact, it's all been assumption. I mean, and that's what we've seen historically Absolutely. with the United States, assuming so, over and over and over again that Native people – I mean, I mean to back up to um, to Johnson v. McIntosh, if you if you recall, one of the other comments that, uh, that Justice John Marshall makes is that, that – um, However pretentious the uh, the uh, the uh, or extravagant the pretension is to equate native uh, or dis- discovery of an inhabited land with conquest, if we can assert it in the in the first instance and sustain it, then it becomes law of the land. So he essentially says merely discovering us was the same as conquest, even though there's plenty of contradiction in treaties. Like I said, I mentioned the, the Canandaigua Treaty, but there's there's language all over the place that, that dances on both sides of this notion of whether Native people were distinct or whether we were conquered, whether we were citizens or whether we were not. So it, it, um, the, most of this is all born out of assumption. And so when you, you know, when, when your platform is all about trying to embrace this we the people, I don't hear a whole lot of language about um, whether uh, where where there's distinction and where the, the recognition of native sovereignty for those native peoples and those native territories that do that want to fight for their land to be distinct and for and want to fight for their for their I mean citizenship. Look at look at the Haudenosaunee uh, denied the right to mm-hmm. travel on their own passports, for instance. These are the things that um, you know if you if we're only going to embrace this we the people, it's it, it's almost like. Well, we we want we want full assimilation. We don't want this this partial or, or this you know racial discrimination. We want full assimilation, and I'm not sure that that's where where many people, if especially if the if the question is posed that way, I don't know how many people are going to say no. I'll surrender my my Navajo citizenship um, uh, and and place that beneath my but uh, beneath the subjugation to the United States. I don't think that a whole lot of people will do that. Yeah, and and that's where you you saw on my press release, I identify myself as a dual citizen of the United States and the Navajo Nation, and that is why the first thing I'm laying out that we need is we need this national dialogue. In his final State of the Union, President Obama, in his speech, he was addressing the need for new politics in the United States, and he said, we the people, our Constitution begins with these three simple words, words we've come to recognize mean all the people. And I heard that, and I immediately said, when? When did we decide? I, I, I've studied our history in depth. I cannot find, I cannot pinpoint a single place. Well, and the question where remains, where, decided, when, did, when did we as Native people decide that, um, that that subjugation or that inclusion was imposed upon us to the extent that we can no longer question it? And I think that's, that well, is that, also a big question. That's, well, that's the part of it. This is what I'm saying, and I'm saying this as a, a member of the Navajo Nation and as a citizen of the United States. I'm the son of both my father and my mother, 
And I'm saying we've never had this dialogue. Yeah, but but, and let, I think but it's let me time back, we had it. Let me back that up though, because let's face it, as even the, the claim for dual citizenship places the native identity beneath that of the United States. That's just that's just the way the United States policy is. And it's not just about and, I mean and that's where because like like I said the United States feels that we are I mean their definition of a federally recognized tribe is is a tribe band or nation of Indians subordinate to the laws of the United States. There's nothing yes, even a though domestic they have, dependent. They have no place where they can say when that happens. There's no date, there's no uh, there's no treaty, there's no agreement on a, a consent mm-hmm. from native people to say, "Okay, we're yours now." So, I mean, yeah. but, but I do, I understand what you're saying. I do want to, I know because we're running out of time, there are a couple of things I want to address specifically. Obviously, in your TED Talk, you, you mentioned, um, you, you talked about the racism, the white supremacy associated with the doctrine of discovery. But you also went on to say that the Declaration of Independence is a systematically white supremacist document. So you make that statement, and then you go on and you say the, the U.S. Constitution is a systematically white supremacist and sexist document. My question is, how does a guy run for president when he, when he, when he takes that view of these, these <laughs> revered documents of American history? I mean, it begs, it begs the question, how do you possibly expect to uh, – um, I mean, because you're not even trying to do damage control. I, 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 you believe that to be the, the case going forward. How does a person run for president who, uh, who views the, the U.S. Constitution as a, as a racist or white supremacist document? Well, this and this is one of the dialogues I'm trying to bring to the forefront. Most of our citizens, most U.S. citizens, have never read the documents that they claim to be governed by. They don't actually know what they say. No, they only, the they know, they know, they know, know the, they know the Pledge of Allegiance and uh, maybe the first verse of, and, the, of the national and the anthem involved as know, far as it goes. You know, so so if you want to become an elected official, if you want to work for the U.S. government, if you want to join the military, you have to take a pledge to protect and defend a document. Now, if you're a person of color, if you're a woman, if you don't identify in the, in the, the binary gender definitions, you have to hope that this document says something that it doesn't actually contain. Well, and that, that's my question. That's if you, you're you're going you're to lay your hand on a Bible, um, and then you're going to you're going to swear an oath to defend and uphold the U.S. Constitution that you view specifically as a both uh, both a white supremacist and sexist document. And uh, so I, I wonder, how do you reconcile that? Well, so on on my on my website, um, which is wirelesshogan.com, this is my personal website. I have you could say a draft of the Constitution where I went through and I actually took out a lot of the sexist and racist languages. And again, not proposing them as amendments, but as edits. Right now this country has a document that is written in the language and the worldview of the 1700s, 1800s. And it was a very sexist, white supremacist, racist worldview and language. And we've never updated it. We've never corrected that. Well, I mean, they they add to it. They make amendments, and they and they and they try to do but, these things. But but again, so, they don't yeah, re- so, they don't revisit some of the. Uh, I mean, it, it's like building, you know, more, uh, are, are just piling it on rather than removing any of this stuff. I guess my question for the U.S. Constitution, from a native standpoint, is: I don't understand why the U.S. Constitution or why you view the the U.S. Constitution as being anti-native, because just because we weren't uh, included. Uh, that's that would have been the the right assumption um, in uh, in the 1790s. It seems to me. And I welcome you to bring that argument to the table. All right. No. So I got to ask you three basic questions then. Well, first off, I mean, we've talked about you running for president. Why would a white person want to vote for you? I. I mean, I mean, understanding most of the view of the of the Constitution, which some of these people hold so dear. I mean, what would what would (laughs) what would be the incentive for for a white person to vote for you? Because America is basically constructed under a myth. It's there's a myth of American exceptionalism. There's a myth of America is the good guys. There's a myth of America is the good countering the evil of the world. And that myth 
is <laughs> it's a myth that that history isn't true. We are one of the top ten, if not the greatest, genocidal nations. I don't think you're. I, I don't think you're. I don't think you're winning white votes here, though. <laughs> no, no, but 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 to keep up the myth, to perpetuate the myth, to keep running, to keep to keep living, and, and to hold yourself together under what you know deep down to be false. Yeah, and and, and let's let's, let's be honest. The, 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 this American exceptionalism is is the modern day version of of white supremacy. I mean, it's yes. I mean, it, it's it, it, it's the coping mechanism for a nation that doesn't know what to do with this genocidal past and its current racist reality. So rather than if being white, rather than being superior, but, but genetically superior, we're going to say that that but they are what historically superior. So that, that's kind of where that comes from. So I mean, but let, let me let me go farther. So why would a why would a native person vote for you then? Why would a native? Person? Yeah, I mean, if if what you're really, I mean, because be honest, I mean, you're you really are kind of promoting this idea about equality within the same government that committed these atrocious acts of so everything from you know genocidal massacres to you know genocidal residential schools to policies that that still you know have you know have our lands being raped and, and manipulated. So why would if what you're promoting is you know more inclusion, which essentially would make us almost meaningless with, as as uh, in the American electorate. We, our our population is so small, we would have no say over our lands if we were fully integrated into into American society. We would we would essentially disappear almost uh, almost just with that. And this is why, at the heart of my campaign, I'm proposing this national dialogue on race, gender, and class, this Truth and Conciliation Commission. When South Africa had their Truth and Conciliation Commission, they wrote a whole new constitution. This is the level of change that we need to talk about as a nation, and we need to decide what to do, and we need to decide, and Native nations need to decide, do we want to be a part of the scene, and do we not? Do we need to... You know, this is the conversation we need to have. Well, and, and of course, the difference and between is, the difference between Africa and here is, in Africa, black people represent the majority. Here, we we've, we've had our numbers decimated. So, you know, even to you know to come up with conciliation, uh, ba- we're, we're never going to get our population back or our lands back. I mean, Africa, black people got control of uh, got control of of, the, of their lives and uh, and their lands and their resources uh, back. I mean, that's the, that was the the effort there. Mm-hmm. Um, the likelihood of that happening right now, just the idea of trying to carve out enough. I mean, even to even to get the United States to fully embrace the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, where our consent is required, we, we can't even get the United States to uh, to agree to that. Yeah. And and this is this is the conversation I'm trying to bring to the forefront. Well, so I mean, so that's essentially your your running for president is an effort to really advance. I mean, really to advance this conversation more so than you know, obviously the the the, the likelihood of, of of winning. You're running as an independent, is that correct? I'm running as an independent. Okay. And my my goal is for the nation I live in, for my mother's people and my father's people to have this dialogue that it's never had before because something has to change well i would argue the we dialogue the dialogue has has happened it, but it never gets uh, it never gets brought up to, like you said to the to the national level and and this is and that's where i'm saying I, that's I, where I, i'm saying this is this is an effort to bring it to the national level well, I wish you luck um, in what you're trying to do. Um, although I will say that uh, I, I still think the the reason the 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 best the biggest reason for promoting um, awareness about the the doctrine of discovery is to assert our right for a free and independent uh, um, existence, not necessarily for. Um, I don't I don't even understand the argument about exposing the doctrine of discovery and then. Using that as the as the premise for for full uh, you know full equal assimilation into the into the into the very uh, peoples and systems that uh, that utilized this the, these racist doctrines to to take our lands to take our freedom to oftentimes kill our people um, I I think mm-hmm. the idea of, of of trying to expose that a, a, a nation that was supposed to 
have a separation of church and state, use this church dogma uh, to, co- to commit crimes um, that, and if the only, uh, if what we're calling conciliation for those crimes is, okay, now now we'll just be part of you. I'm not sure, I don't, I, that's where I, I still struggle. And 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 this is, yeah, this is the conversation that we've never had, and I'm, I'm convinced we need to have this dialogue, and we need to have it not in the local communities where we've been having it. We need to have it at a national level. Well, I, I don't disagree with that. And, I don't and the nation needs to decide, and Native peoples need to come to the table and be full partners and equal in that conversation. Well, uh, whether your presidency, whether your candidacy does this or not, um, I will. I would. Uh, I, hey, I, I'd love to participate in a conversation uh, on a national level, uh, so people understand and, both levels of this. Both uh, for those native people who want to fully embrace their, you know, patriotism and and loyalty to the to to the very country that was never returned the same, um, and to those of us who want to maintain, yes, that we are distinct and we we have a right, legal, morally, scientifically, we have a right to exist as a distinct people from the United States. And that doesn't mean that it has to be isolationist. It just means that we that, mm-hmm. that there should be some recognition uh, and respect given to that. And I, I want to bring, I want to create a space where all sides of that argument can come and and be empowered to express their arguments, express what they feel. And to, because this is the conversation we need to have. We've buried that conversation for centuries. We've assumed things. We've enacted things. We've, we've well, and, and, and by, and by, we've and by elevated we, other people. By we, you mean the United States has done that? The United States of America, yes. Okay. And, but also, and I mean, yeah, we've as native peoples, we've we've been subjugated to these things. Well, I mean, I, I, and, and again, to, to quote Ruth Bader Ginsburg, as you you cited in in your uh, your TED talk, I mean, when when she makes the um, the reference um, to when the Oneidas uh, were were talking about trying to or um, unify their lands back to them and reclaim the lands, and they said. Uh, um, uh, preclude tribes from rekindling embers of sovereignty that long of ago sovereignty grew that cold. long ago grew cold. I mean, yeah. es- essentially, that's almost what it, assimilation does. That it, it eliminates. So, so it eliminates this notion of not only land being uh, in the sovereign possession of native peoples, but but our existence being able to exist as a distinct people. So, I just, I'm just, I don't think any native people. Even those who, at some level, embrace a level of assimilation, I don't think any of them want their uh, their sovereignty to be considered something uh, as embers having grown cold. I think many of us, yeah, and and I don't under, I don't know where within the system, the American system, that those two things can coexist. I I think it is it oftentimes does get put into an all or nothing proposition, and that's where I see. John Kane and Mark Charles being on, on perhaps on separate uh, conversations there because it is almost an all or nothing comp, uh, um, uh, you know, <laughs> proposition. And I am, after living on our reservation for over 11 years and studying this doctrine and looking at the history with the church and looking at my own family and my own history. I feel that not that there's no guarantee what I'm trying to do is going to be successful. No guarantee at all. But I think it represents one of the better chances we have of actually trying to get the dialogue to go somewhere. Because I'm I'm even disappointed in in what what Canada uh, achieved with their Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Oh, I Um, I, I would agree. And and in fact, you know, whether we're talking about you know evaluating residential schools or missing and murdered Indigenous women, it it's we see we still see a continuation of um of that same um, 
philosophy or ideology um, that that gave that, that produced the genocide that continues to address even as they try to address that genocide it still has that same that racist and white supremacist uh, 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 overtone to it yeah and I, I so many of these movements you could make the argument whether it's the um, the truth and reconciliation in Canada or even some aspects of the civil rights movement here in the US they provide opportunities for the, the majority culture to participate in a dialogue and and fix it in a way so it doesn't really go anywhere. Well, and and, uh, and again, I think what sometimes people confuse the difference between human rights and civil rights. Civil rights are essentially mm-hmm. rights within the system, right? That's that's it's it's within what is considered the the norms of that civil society. Human rights are are really a, a right you know, bestowed by creation, not necessarily by by man's law. So when we talk about civil rights, I mean, and this is the difference between what what a, what a black man in in the United States is fighting for, or or any other any other people of color who embrace their American citizenship, or are trying to find fight for rights within American citizens, uh, American citizenship, and Native people who who oftentimes, if not even fully understanding it, are still trying to fight for their distinction. More so than yeah. uh, than than full inclusion or or equality within the civil society. Well, and we have two large groups of people in the U.S. who never um, who had this nation imposed upon them. The first is obviously Native Americans who are quote unquote discovered, and then we have our African Americans who are brought here as slaves. And both of these groups of people had. U.S. citizenship enacted upon them out of the quote-unquote benevolence of the country. Well, and, and we could argue never... that, that actually most of the black population was bred in the United States. Uh, only about a half a million African uh, Africans were brought to the, uh, to North America. The rest, yeah. of, they were all bred in captivity. And so you're right, but, but I agree. This was it, it is an imposed culture upon a people. It's an, um, it's an imposed system. And we have to deal with that. We, this is what makes these two communities a, a very unique set. You know, we talk about the nation will talk about this as a nation of immigrants. Well, that marginalizes, dehumanizes, or disregards the position of our Native communities who never immigrated here. And it disregards the history with African people who were brought here as slaves. Yeah, they, they certainly didn't immigrate. They, uh, they were, yeah. they were, and so even the, the way, world. the way the nation talks about its foundation, which is where the nation of immigrants, that's not true. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree with that completely. And, you know, and, and of course, this is where we as, as native people, um, living in a world where, where the, the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is, uh, you know, passed in 2007, voted against, by the United States and Canada and uh, New Zealand mm-hmm. and Australia, still see countries like the United States and Canada operating in stark violation of almost all of the articles of of, the, of that. I, I realize it's a non-binding declaration, but the fact that we can't even have that conversation, where the rest of the world yeah. has, at least at some level, embraced this this notion that there should be a minimum standard that that the nation states of the world should recognize for the for the survival and dignity of um uh, of native peoples and and we're we're not even there so um and that that doesn't even carve out things like sovereignty and distinction necessarily as uh, you know at, it, it, the, even the UN declaration of the rights of indigenous peoples is about um inclusion it's not necessarily about distinction and and so it's i mean it's, it's certainly not a panacea for the problem but we can't even get the united states to accept the 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 minimum standards that the UN, the international community has, has put forth. Yeah. And if you listen, you know, in my announcement video, I phrase my campaign the next 18 months between now and November of 2020. It's, this is an 18 month dialogue, an 18 month journey. And I want to use the next 18 months to not just lay out my policies, but to actually educate our nation on its history. And because we, most Americans, most U.S. citizens do not know the history of their nation, they, they accept this mythology that's been presented, which is a false mythology, and therefore we end up 
not actually being able to solve the problems we're facing because no one wants to bring the conversation down to the foundational level. You know, we, we tend, Amer U.S. citizens tend to believe that this nation is white supremacist, racist, and sexist in spite of our foundations. In other words, the foundations were good and we just messed them up. And I'm telling people, no, the United States is white supremacist, racist, and sexist because of our foundations. Like these thoughts, this worldview, this language is embedded into them. And we have to deal with that. And this is, this is what, this is the history I'm trying to teach. And this is, it's out of this history that we can now, I'm hoping, have a more productive dialogue about how do we fix the problems. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't know if, if being president of the United States will do that, but <laughs> but uh, I, I guess we'll we'll see what your how your dialogue goes over the next eighteen months. Um, I want to thank you for giving me this so much of your time to talk about. And these are tough subjects. And I and I and you know we you and I represent. I'm not saying opposite ends of a spectrum, but certainly different places on a spectrum. Uh, about native existence, identity, and that kind of thing. I, I frankly do not consider myself uh, a U.S. citizen. I consider myself um, um, Ungwe. I consider myself Gunyagahaga, the people of the land of Flint, Mohawk. And uh, yeah. uh, and I don't. And I think the idea that I have to embrace um, a dual citizenship, where my personal identity takes, you know, stands beneath or subjugated. Um, on on a on another citizenship. I mean, the idea that that the international community won't push back on the United States for things like you know our ability to produce our own travel documents and that kind of stuff. These are these are some of the problems that uh, that kind of show that not that the United States put places themselves in the driver's seat not only in terms of world domination with military presence all over, but in terms of you know how uh, how nations interact with each other and. And this is, a, this is a challenge. But Mark Charles, I want to thank you for joining me. I know you've given me much more time than you uh, than you probably signed up for. Um, uh, thank you for for bantering with me on these conversations and uh, um, and stay in touch. John, I appreciate you. I, I have great respect for the show you're doing and for the work you're doing. And I, one of my goals is to create a dialogue where whether it's you or and me or even other people coming from different spaces can actually sit down and have this conversation and discuss these things and find a way forward. I'd love so to do it. Thank you for having me. Love to do it. I look forward to having more conversations. All right. You take care of yourself. Travel well. Okay. Right. Take care. All right. Hold on.